chapter 6 verse 19 we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek aren't you grateful this morning that we have an anchor of the soul in Jesus Christ you know life is difficult life is filled with Hardships, tribulations, and um, I was talking with Brother Glenn before the service, and we were just talking about that very thing, but we agreed that it's good that we have an anchor, an anchor that truly holds in Jesus Christ, and I hope that you know Christ in a personal way. I hope today you can say, yes, he is my anchor. He has held me through the storms of life, and I know that he will continue to hold on to me as I travel through this thing called life, and that's why we're here today just to praise the name of Jesus Christ. And so with that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your glorious name. We thank you that you are an anchor for our souls. And Lord Jesus, we just want to come to you now, and we want to honor you with our praises. We want to honor you with every part of our lives. And Lord, we know that sin is deceptive and it's blinding and lord i pray if there's anything in our lives that we are totally oblivious to anything that is dishonoring to your name lord would you reveal that to us so that we can repent turn from that so that we can walk in obedience to your word so that we can be the witnesses that you have called us to be lord i pray today for the needs that 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 people have people who are just going through difficulties, hardships, who have burdens for individuals. We pray for those who don't give evidence that they know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We pray that you would work in their hearts for those who are saved, but they've wandered off the path, Lord Jesus. We just pray that you would bring them back, uh, Lord. And Father, we just uh, thank you for loving us, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to come into your house to worship you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would dwell amongst us, that you would do warfare on our behalf, protect us from the enemy, shelter us, Father, from his, his wicked schemes, those arrows that he, he shoots at us and he, he wants to uh, um, work in our minds and he tells us lies. And, and Lord, I pray that you would guard us with your truth today. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the hope of salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. And we ask these things in Christ's name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, it is good to see everybody this morning. Certainly, we want to welcome all of our guests. It's good to have you today. 
as we lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Be sure that you fill out the who's who in the pew. That way we can have a record of everybody's attendance. And let me just say this. Um, our Sunday school the past couple weeks has been a little low. And um, I, I just want to, to say, be sure that we are making contacts, that we're, we're contacting those absentees, those people we haven't seen in su uh, Sunday school in a while, and those who have never been to Sunday school. You know, there are, there are church members who come to church, and that's wonderful, but don't ever come to Sunday school. And we want to call them, we want to invite them so that they can come and be a part of a small group Bible study where we learn about what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. So I just want to throw that... Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, our glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Well, this morning I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 20, we're going to be in verses 9 through 18. Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 18. We'll let the choir find their seats. This Wednesday night, as you're finding your seats, we're going to be blessed. Mr. Caleb Cunningham is going to be bringing our Wednesday night message, so um, be praying for Caleb, and uh, please come and support him. I know that you'll, you will um, be blessed. That'll be Wednesday night during our normal Wednesday night Bible study. All right, Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 9. Please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. The Bible says, and he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another tenant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a yet a third, this one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for our time of worship. Thank you for the written word of God. Thank you that you've given us your truth. Lord, we come to yet another parable, and Lord, we pray that you would use this earthly illustration that you gave in order to speak a spiritual truth into our hearts and lives. Lord, give us the ears to hear your truth today, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take that truth Apply it to our hearts and change us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Perhaps you are one who enjoys a good murder mystery. You will remember if you were alive back in the mid-90s. I think most of us were alive in the mid-90s. Uh, but you remember that case with O.J. Simpson. And boy, that was uh, something else. I remember sitting there on the TV watching that uh, white Bronco going down the highway and all the drama that went with it. And then, of course, the court case that went on seemed like forever, for weeks. And finally, he was declared innocent. And I read the other day where they were demolishing his house. And there was this rumor that supposedly they found a knife, you know, and all this stuff. Uh, today, we, we come to this story it talks about the murder in the vineyard. The murder in the vineyard. Now, last week we saw that Jesus, he had come through into the triumphal entry. There, there, this is the last week of Jesus' life during the Passover. And he'd come, and it was the triumphal in entry, and people were praising, shouting praises to his name again. They, they thought that Jesus was a political Messiah. They thought that Jesus would come establish his earthly kingdom in their lifetime, that he would, he would um, uh, run the, the Roman oppression out and he would set up his earthly kingdom. And the first thing that Jesus does, though, when he comes to Jerusalem is he doesn't do that. He doesn't um, run the Romans out, but instead he goes to the temple, God's house, the place of worship. And instead of running the Romans out, we see him running the the money changers and the, the people who were selling 
um, the sacrifices, taking advantage of, of people. He, we find him running them out of the temple. And then after cleansing the temple, he teaches. He begins to teach in the temple. Again, Jesus' his, his purpose for coming, his, his greatest concern for the people was not for them to be released from that Roman oppression, but his greatest concern for the people was for them to be lifted from their spiritual oppression. He was concerned about their hearts. So, so now that he has the temple cleared out of all the chaos, he's able to once again teach, and he's teaching them the gospel. He teaches them what it means to be a follower, what it means to be saved. But there was a group of people who were not very happy with his teaching. They're upset, and this was the, the religious rulers of the day, and they questioned Jesus about his authority. They, in essence, say, who, who, just who do you think that you are coming in here doing this, driving out the tax collector or the, uh, the money changers and all that? Who do you think you are? Where do you get your authority from? And then, of course, Jesus um, answers the question with a question and uses that basically to show the the religious leaders, what hypocrites they were, and um, really makes them look like complete fools. And so this story today really is an answer to their question. Where do you get the authority? Who, who, just who do you think that you are? So we're going to look at this parable. Now, um, we know just from studying the book of Luke that this was, this was Jesus' central way of teaching truth, spiritual truth. He would teach through parables. Parables were earthly illustrations that had spiritual applications. Most of the time when the people were given the parables, they, they were left in the dark because parables were also a form of judgment. For those whose hearts were hardened to Jesus, he would teach truth to those who wanted it, but to those who rejected who he was and his claims, Parables actually blinded the truth from their eyes. Well, in this parable, we see that the religious leaders, who, by the way, this is, this is who the, the parable ultimately was for, at the end of the parable, we see that they get it. They understand exactly who Jesus is talking about. And we're not going to turn to Isaiah chapter 5, but Isaiah chapter 5, and those first five, six verses are talking about Israel being God's vineyard and how he cultivated Israel, and he was looking for Israel to produce fruits, and because they did not produce fruit, he was going to send judgment upon them, and he did. He raised up the Babylonians, and the Babylonians uh, brought the nation of Judah into captivity. So, so they know, at the end of this parable, they know exactly what Jesus, or who Jesus is talking to. So there's, there's two divisions I want to look at as we look at the murder in the vineyard. First of all, I want us to look in verses 9 through the first part of verse 16, and I want us to look at the story Jesus wants us to hear. This is a story that Jesus wants us today to hear. Yes, it was, it was directly for the religious leaders in the nation of Israel, but it's for us as well. So let's look at this story, the story's plot. It has a unique plot. Now, again, Jesus wouldn't just tell just random stories that the people could not relate to. He always, he was the master storyteller, and he always used illustrations that they could relate to. And in Jesus' time, vineyards were very common. I mean, they would have vineyards on the sides of hills. I mean, it was just a very common thing for landowners to to grow vineyards. But this is how it would work. The landowner oftentimes would plant a vineyard and then he would uh, allow tenant farmers to come and basically rent that vineyard from him. And so they would, they would be the farmers over that land and then as a way of rent they would give back a portion of the, the harvest to the landowner. And oftentimes, the landowner would be away when it, was, when it was harvest time. So he would send servants on his behalf who would go, would go to the farmer and he would, in essence, collect rent from the one who was farming uh, the land. So in our story here, we have this landowner. He planted a vineyard. Then it says that he went away for a very long time. But it comes time for the harvest, so he sends a servant he sends a servant to the tenants to, to collect. 
But the text says there in verse 10 that they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Well, the landowner then sends a second servant. And, and their reaction to the second servant is very similar to the first servant. It says they beat him, they treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And then he sends a third servant. With the third servant, they treat him a little bit more harshly because it says they wounded and cast him out. So then after sending three servants, the landowner says, well... I will send my beloved son. Now that word beloved has the idea of my one and only son. I will send my cherished son to collect rent and surely they will respect my son being that he is my heir. But you'll notice there in verse 14 it says, But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, in those days, if a landowner died and there was no heir to come and collect the land, after three years, if no one had come to claim the land, then the ones who were farming the land could claim the land for themselves. So here are these wicked... Uh, farmers, these tenants, and they see the son coming. And so they're thinking, okay, the owner has died, and if we kill the son, then the, the land becomes our own. So it says that they cast him out of the vineyard, and they kill him. Now this is absolutely insane. I mean, to think that these tenants would have the audacity to treat the vineyard as if it was their own. They were seeking to control what was not theirs. This did not belong to them. The vineyard was, was not there. I remember growing up, we had a, a hummingbird feeder. And, uh, you know, if you've ever had a hummingbird feeder, you know that those hummingbirds can become very possessive of those feeders. And they begin to fight and, and they, they run off uh, other hummingbirds. And I always thought to myself, that's interesting. These Hummingbirds are claiming something that really doesn't belong to them. We're the ones that put the, the sweet nectar, if you will, into the little jar. It belongs to us, but they claimed it for themselves. This is like this story here, these tenants running off the servants, treating the land as if it was their own. So then, it says, after he had sent his beloved son, and they throw him out of the vineyard, and they kill him, Jesus presents a question You'll see that at the end of verse 15. He says, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? And at this point, they said, well, well, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. That only makes sense that if the landowner knew how wicked the servants were, then he's going to come and he's going to deal with those wicked servants and he'll get somebody else to take care of his vineyard. He'll give it to others. So that's the story. That's the story. That's the plot of what's going on. So, so that's the story that Jesus wants us to hear. Secondly, in the last part of these verses, verse 16 through 18, we learn about the application Jesus wants us to make. There is an application. There was a purpose behind this story. And you'll notice at the end of verse 16, it's like the light comes on. The crowd, again, is the religious leaders and others, and, the, and, then, and they're like, wait a minute, surely not. This cannot be so. They're reacting to when Jesus says, okay, because of the wicked ser uh, servants, because of, of their rejection, I'm going to take the, the, the landowner would take the vineyard and give it to somebody else. And so at this point, all of a sudden, Isaiah 5 begins to resonate in their ears, and they understand that Jesus is applying this to themselves. They understand that Jesus is talking about them because, recognize this church, the religious leaders at this point, they were already determined, they had already decided that they were going to murder Jesus. It was just a matter of time. They couldn't do it right then because the people were being drawn to Jesus, but they were already scheming and planning at how they would go about um, uh, murdering Jesus. So, so the, the purpose of the whole story was to rebuke the nation of Israel as, as a whole for their fruitlessness, but also specifically for the religious leaders for their rejection and their future murder of the Savior. And so, this is, this is what he tells them. He says, 
What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Of course, a building would have a cornerstone. And that one stone served as the plumb line for the rest of the building. It was very, very important. The cornerstone was the foundation, foundational stone of the entire structure. He says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Of course, the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. He's saying you have rejected the cornerstone. Verse 18, he says, Because you have rejected the cornerstone, judgment is coming. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. In other words, you fall on the stone, your life, if you reject the stone, your life is going to be shattered into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. It will grind him to a fine powder through judgment. So, here's, here's the, the, kind of how we apply this. The owner, of course, is God. God is the owner of the vineyard. And they understood these details. Again, the vineyard would be Israel. The tenants, who were the tenants? The religious leaders. The religious leaders in Israel, the servants that the the owner had sent, were representative of the Old Testament prophets that God had sent to his people, calling his people to a, to a place, to a life of holiness. But sadly, they rejected the prophets. They, 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 they treated the prophets shamefully, and oftentimes they murdered the prophets, including the prophet John the Baptist. They rejected his message as well. And of course, we know that the parable, in the parable, the beloved son is Jesus Christ. Christ, the one and only Son of God. And, and it's interesting, it says that when he sent his beloved son, they took him outside of the vineyard and killed him. And, and certainly that's what, in just a couple days after this, the religious leaders would do, would ultimately be Jesus would be taken outside of Jerusalem and he would be murdered. So despite all that God had done for his vineyard, they rejected him. Now think about Israel being God's vineyard. God was gracious to them in his, in his marvelous grace of all the peoples in the world. Of all the nations of the world, he chose Israel to be a part of his vineyard. He chose them. Why not other, the other nations? We don't know, but it was just his grace that he chose the, the Israelites to be his chosen people. And he cared for them. He took them out of Egypt and he placed them into a fertile land. And certainly God cultivated Israel by giving them prophets who gave them the very word of God. But certainly, uh, as, as, as a gracious God, he was patient with them. Again, over and over again, God sent them messengers, but they refused to turn from their idolatry and their wickedness. I mean, in God's grace, he sent them people like Isaiah and Jeremiah who called them to a place of repentance because the, 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 the people that they were hurting was only themselves by turning to false gods. And so he sends them these prophets. Listen to what Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 25 through 26 says. It says, Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early, sending them to you. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Now, I was interested, I just, I just uh, as I was studying, learned about some of the fate of, of some of the Old Testament prophets. Did you know that history tells us that Isaiah was sawn in two? He was sawed in half by a wooden saw. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, with tears of of pity for the people. He, he cried out to the people day and night, pleading with them to turn from their wickedness. And in response, they lowered him into a miry pit and eventually stoned him to death. Ezekiel was rejected. Micah was, had his face smashed in. Zechariah was murdered in the temple. And then as you, as you come into the Old Testament, that prophet John the Baptist, we see, was rejected. And he was beheaded. 
God in His patience sent prophets time after time again calling his, his vineyard to repentance, but yet they rejected Him until finally God in His love sent them His only Son. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, By this we know love because He laid down His life for us. So God had been patient. Israel was His vineyard and He cultivated them and He sent them prophets. And time after time after time they rejected the prophets and... and, and um, Finally, he, he sent his only son, and they would reject his son. But as you see at the end of the text, God certainly is a gracious God. God is a loving God, but we see God is a just God. There's a high price to pay for rejecting the son because God's patience eventually runs out. And we know from, from church history that in A.D. 70, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. They were judged because of the hardness of their hearts, because ultimately they rejected the chief cornerstone. Peter, in Acts chapter 4, as he's preaching powerfully under the, the power of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, he says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel by, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I like to say this, a life without the cornerstone will never be square. A life without Jesus Christ will never be square. There is only one way of salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ, and sadly... The very ones who Jesus came to first, the nation of Israel, as a whole, they rejected him and ended up putting him on the cross. So this parable, again, it was for the religious leaders specifically. It was for the nation of Israel. It was a, it was a parable speaking, a warning of judgment because of their fruitlessness and because of ultimately their rejection of Jesus. So two words of application how do we apply this to our lives as New Testament believers? Well, we know that as believers, we are part of God's vineyard. We are part of God's vineyard. Going back to the story, it says that, um, he says, What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He says, He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, who would the vineyard be given to? Us, Gentiles. Now, God, listen, church, the church has not replaced Israel. God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. And one day, one day there's going to be a great awakening amongst the Jewish people. And there will be thousands of Jewish people who are going to turn to the Messiah. But by God's grace, we as the church, we have been grafted in so that we are now part of His vineyard. And just like the Old Testament people, by His grace, we have been chosen to be a part of His vineyard. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we were chosen uh, to be a part of the vineyard. And He has cultivated us. He, because we are His vineyard, He wants us to produce fruit for His glory. So He cultivates us. How does He cultivate the soil of our hearts? Well, He gives us the Word of God. We are so blessed today that we have the Word of God. It is the Word of God that God uses to cultivate our hearts. But also, He gives us the Holy Spirit who comes. And, 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 and we learned about this in Sunday school. At the moment of salvation... The moment you repent of your sins and you by faith embrace the Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and He lives inside of you. You don't get some of the Spirit. You get all of the Spirit at the very moment of salvation and it is the Holy Spirit that works in your life, transforming you more into the image of His Son. Again, all this by grace. But you know something else as I was reading this parable. The landowner was so patient. Was he not? He was so patient. He sent them... Three servants. And in audacity, they reject the servants. And then he sends them his only son. You know what? God 
is patient with us. Uh, he, he, he was patient with us before our salvation. I think about what First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is patient or long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, so today, if you know Christ Jesus as your Savior, God was patient with you before your salvation. I wonder how many times did, did God send you a messenger to give you the truth, and you harden your heart but in, his, in His forbearance and in His patience with you, and finally, your, your heart was softened to the, to the good news of Jesus Christ. So He is patient with us before our salvation, but I like this. God is patient with us after our salvation. Because you know what? I have yet to meet a Christian who, at the very moment of their salvation, immediately, man, they just got everything right. I mean, they were just the perfect Christian. You know, as believers in Christ, positionally, we are forgiven in Christ Jesus. That is a wonderful truth to know that at the moment of salvation, and what do I mean by at the moment of salvation? What I mean by, by that terminology is, is that, that moment that, that in humility you recognize that you are a sinner, that you have sinned against a holy God and you deserve God's punishment upon your life, but you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ gave His life for you and you believe that He rose from the grave and you place your faith in Christ and you recognize that Christ is your only hope. And that moment He comes and He lives inside of you and every one of your sins are forgiven. And I, and I know I say this many times, but it bears repeating. When you are saved, all of your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future sins. Even those sins that you have yet to commit, they are under the blood. They are forgiven. But you know what? While we are forgiven in Christ positionally, in our practice, boy, we mess up. We dare not look around at the faults of others. Because the last time I checked, there's a whole lot of faults that I have in my life. And while as people, sometimes, I, I know personally, I cannot speak for you, but I can be so impatient with other Christians. Why don't they get it? I don't understand. And I preach to them and I preach to them, they just don't get it. You ever have those moments? But you know what? God is patient with us. and He's cultivating us because He... He loves us. And so, so we are His vineyard, and He cultivates us, and He, and he, and he grows us, and He's patient uh, with us. So, so the first application is, as believers, we are part of God's vineyard. But secondly and finally, God looks to His vineyard to produce fruit. Just like in the Old Testament, He was looking for fruit to come out of the nation of Israel. He's looking to his church. We who have been grafted in to his vineyard. He's looking for fruit from our lives. And of course, we can't produce the fruit in our own strength. The Holy Spirit of God, as he works in our lives, he, he gives us the ability to, to work for his glory. God's looking for fruit in our, in our lives. And, and again, he cultivates us with his word and he gives us teachers to teach us his word so that through that we, we produce fruits that bring glory and honor to his name. And so we just have to ask ourselves this question, am I, am I producing good fruit today or is my life producing bad fruit? And ultimately, fruit is just Christ-likeness. Am I growing to become more and more like Jesus Christ in my life? Or the fruit of my life is not good. It's sour. It's bitter. There's, there's known sin in my life. And if you're living in sin today, perhaps right now the Spirit of God is bringing conviction to your heart. If He is, turn from that sin. Because, yes, God is a loving God. And He's a gracious God. And He's a patient God. But the, the parable ends with this truth that God is a patient God. And God, one day, His patience is going to run out. 
And perhaps today you, you're a good person. You're, you're, a, you're a faithful church member, but you're lost. You're not saved. And so you're really no different than these people in, in the story. You're rejecting the Son because you're trying, you're trying through some other way to earn your salvation. You need to repent of your sin because one day time is going to be no more and there's not going to be any second chances. And so maybe today your greatest need is you need to be forgiven by placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But today, maybe you are one of God's children. Yes, you're saved. You know you have an eternal home, but you're living in sin. There's sin in your life and you need to deal with that sin because God ultimately deals with sin. Sin. I love what R.G. Lee, the late R.G. Lee, said. He said, the wheels of God's justice grind slowly, but they grind surely to a fine powder. And so today, we just have to come before the Lord and we have to say, okay, Lord, would you examine my heart? And have I received the Son? Or am I rejecting the Son? And maybe you've received Him and you're saved, but in your practice, you're rejecting Him because you're not living according to His Word. And so right now, we're going to have a time of invitation. This is just an opportunity for us just to do business with God, to allow God to, to search our hearts, to reveal to us anything in our, in our lives that, that are dishonoring to Him. Maybe right now you say, you know what, I have struggled with knowing for sure that I'm saved. I, I, I just don't know for sure, but I want to get it settled. If that's you today, don't put it off. Come forward, or after the service, come, and we'll sit down with you. We'll take a Bible, and we'll show you how you can know for sure you're saved. Maybe today you're saved, you're just struggling with something. These altars are going to be open to you. Forsake pride. Come to these altars. You know what? There's just something. You say, well, I can do business with God right there at my seat. You know what? You can. But there's just something about coming to the altar in humility and brokenness and pouring your request out before the Lord. And I, and I recognize some of you can't do that physically. You can't do that. And certainly God understands that. But you know what? There's some of you, you're, you've been a believer for, for many years. And you can't even remember the last time it was that you just came to these altars. And you just poured your heart out to God. And, and you know what? You can come to the altar. And that doesn't mean that you have sin in your life. Maybe it's just that you have a burden for somebody else. Maybe there's somebody in your family or there's a friend and, and you're concerned about their salvation or you're concerned about their spiritual walk and you just want to come to, that, come to these altars and lift that person before the Lord. Whatever it is that you feel you need to do, you do as we sing our hymn of invitation this morning. So please stand. Let's have a, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that in your grace and your mercy... You have chosen to allow us to be grafted into your vineyard. We are your people through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that you cultivate us with your word. You cultivate the soil of our hearts with the Spirit of God. And we thank you that you're patient with us. There's not a single perfect person here. There's only been one perfect person. That's Jesus Christ. And we all need Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Would we just get real with you today. I pray, Father, that this would be an environment that we can know and have the comfort of knowing that we can be real. And so, Lord, if we need to come to the altar, Lord, may we be obedient to do that. Certainly, Father, if, if you're not telling us to come, then we don't want to come. But we just want to leave knowing, uh, Lord, that we've been obedient to your voice. So, Father, we give you this time of invitation and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.